I think Evening Primrose really is, has become one of my big allies, my plant allies that it took me years to kind of fall into like, okay, what are my plant allies? And I would say Evening Primrose definitely has become one of them pretty quickly. So. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. It was such a pleasure to spend time with Ginger Webb and experience her absolute love of the plants. I also love that she chose Evening Primrose, an herb that is so deeply special to her. And even if you don't have this particular species that grows near you, chances are you'll have some type of Evening Primrose nearby. And as you'll see, this is a swoon-worthy plant that is a delight to get to know. For those of you who don't already know Ginger, she's been practicing herbalism in and around Austin, Texas for over 25 years. Trained by Michael Moore at the Southwest School of Botanical Medicine, Ginger carries on Michael's tradition of bioregional populist herbalism, adding her own perspectives and working most closely with the plants of Central Texas. She supplies small batch lovingly made herbal medicine to her clients and community through her company, Texas Medicinals, and teaches herbalism, including a 200 hour foundational program and a shorter clinical program as the primary teacher at Sacred Journey School of Herbalism. Ginger currently lives on six acres in the Texas Hill Country and enjoys regular visits from her 21 year old child, Chia, and Chia's French bulldog, Ham. Welcome to the show, Ginger. Thank you, Rosalie. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And man, I just love your bio and how much honor and respect you give to Michael. That's just a beautiful thing to honor. Wow, Michael Moore. Right. You know, so many of us owe him so much. I mean, he was such a presence. And, uh, you know, the fact that he also wrote books <laughs> is so helpful. It, it reminds me all the time that I need to be writing a book because I feel like, um, you know, we're able, he's able, we're able to carry on his legacy so well because he wrote these amazing books. So um, I feel really honored to have been able to study with him. Really grateful. Mm, yeah. I feel a little, I did study with him long distance, which is not the same thing. Um, and then of course I've poured over his books for many decades yeah. now. So. Yeah, I'm a little jealous that you yeah. got that opportunity, but also just <laughs> that you did and that you're, you know, not only passing on his legacy and all that he gave us, but adding to it through your many years of your own plant path and explorations. Um, but that's where I'd like to start, actually. So I know that you studied with Michael Moore, but how else did you find your way onto the plant path? Well, before Michael, I mean, Michael was kind of the culmination in a lot of ways, studying with Michael. Um, You know, I came to herbalism through the environmental movement, and it was while trying to kind of figure out, like kind of brainstorm, like how on earth do you get people to care about the planet? And I realized that people need to be able to feel connected to the planet, need to feel connected to nature. And I really thought about like myself and how, um, you know, there I was working at a desk again and how could, um, what did I need in order to feel connected to nature? And as I was thinking about all this and mulling, mulling it over, I kind of stumbled upon herbalism and I just thought, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I want to do that. So my joke, of course, is always, it was right at the Saturn return and my Saturn return and, you know, my whole life blew up and the only thing left was herbalism. And so I just, Mm -hmm. I just ran, I ran with it, you know? So working at the American Botanical Council, I was, Uh, introduced to plant researchers and herbalists. And it was the herbalists that I was definitely more attracted to in terms of where my interests lay. And um, 
and especially Michael just being, you know, here I am in Texas and his focus was on the Southwestern plants in the United States. And, uh, and his books are so funny. And um, so I figured out like, oh, I, I better go study with him sooner than later. So that's what I did. Hmm. I love that. We kind of had a similar entryway too, in that I also was brought in, in part, you know, through the environmental movement and kind of my feelings of like, anger slash desperation slash cynicism mm -hmm. that were not yeah. getting me anywhere. <laughs> you know, like that was just not a good right. stew. <laughs> And, right. you know, like spending a lot of time, like trying to like force people's attention to care and just that wasn't working. And, um, but as my love of the plants and the landscape grew and I watched my fellow students have that same kind of transformation about, it wasn't just about, you know, like this kind of abstract idea anymore, but it was very much rooted in place and land that that was a big, like, Oh, this is the way, this is the way. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think that a lot of times I, I want to, you know, health, of course, plays a big part in it, right? Obviously, um, herbalism is so much about human health as well. But my focus has always been, you know, the whole thing about we are stewards of the earth, we're stewards of the earth first, and medicine makers second, you know, like if, mm -hmm. we, if we have to steward the plants, um, and I teach that to my students too, right? Like we steward them first. And then if we're able to harvest them and work with them as medicine, then we do. But our primary focus is really on, on the health of the earth and the health of the populations and falling in love with the plants, really. It's just like, you know, we go out in the field and we squeal when we find cute little flowers. And <laughs> if that's all they do with plants, I'm thrilled. So. <laughs> mm. I love it. It's in my mind, I'm like envisioning, you know, it's like there's all these different ways to be an herbalist. And I'm not here to say one way is right or wrong. But just for me, being outside and squealing over the plants and being <laughs> and ending them is like it's just way more exciting than like the like the supplement aisle. Right. Which, again, it's yeah. not like I don't buy supplements or even herbs in the supplement mm -hmm. aisle. But if I have my choice <laughs> that, you know, that other way of being right the plants and the flowers and tending it's just so much more life enriching and so much more impactful overall than like buying yeah. a bottle. Yeah, and that's why also in my foundational course um I every year I add more and more botany. So especially mm -hmm. with what I've heard is that in at the university level botany is being taught less and less and my intention is to like well let's do some grassroots learning of it here and so we actually do keying out of plants in the foundational program. It's like, no, let's learn the plant parts. Let's learn how to identify them. Let's learn all of that mm -hmm. without going super duper overboard into using the big old thick, um, what's it called? A key. Yeah. We don't use the huge key cause it's a little cumbersome. <laughs> it's, <insane. Yeah. laughs> it's a little too much, but we use some smaller keys and I teach them all that, all the botany so that, mm -hmm. you know, they'll be empowered to be able to, if they're using a plant app, they can actually determine, Hey, I think that answer's wrong. And I know why. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I always um, tell people, it's like, somebody had to write that app. So somebody needs to know the botany. Right. Let it be us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like just treasure my memories of being like, I was the person who didn't know any plants when I started. And so I went from like the wall of green to like finding, new, yeah. you know, getting more intimately familiar with plants and finding new friends. So I love that that transformation is happening with your foundational group too. Cause that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to watch that every year with students is just, Oh, what a blessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Um, it's that shift that happens with them every year. Yeah. yeah. Here, nice. Well, I'm gonna be honest, Ginger. I wasn't expecting you to do ginger, right? When you chose your herb, I wasn't expecting <laughs> that. But I really was not expecting evening primrose, and I am so delighted that you chose this plant because I think it's a plant that so many people are familiar with in a bottle. You know, like evening primrose oil as a <laughs> supplement. But if that is all you know about evening primrose, wow, there's just so much to, that you're missing out on. So I'm just, I'm mm -hmm. so excited that you're going to talk about this one. And um, especially it's been really fun, you know, working with this pink one, if the botanical illustrations, the one that's local to you, it's just, yeah. I mean, every, if people know me at all, they know I love pink. So <laughs> it's just, it's been so fun to be kind of immersed in that and thinking about this for the conversation. So uh, let me begin by asking, why did you choose evening primrose? 
Well, I really wanted to choose an herb that grows locally here in Central Texas where I live. And then also one that was, you know, one that's kind of swoon worthy, you know, like there's lots of, we have lots of medicinal plants that grow here, but this one just, I just swoon. It makes me swoon. <laughs> I think that's what I was trying to say. It makes me swoon. I've been swooning over evening primrose ever since you mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. So most people know about evening primrose because they've heard of using the um, the oil, right? And so that's not an infused oil. That's a expressed oil, right? I believe it's like they take the seeds. This is this happens in a factory where they express the seeds to get the, the oil and the oil is high in essential fatty acids. So that's all wonderful, but that's beyond kind of like my scope of use. I definitely don't, it's, I'm not going to be talking about the, the seed oil use. What I'm talking about today is the leaf and flower use. Michael Moore talked about using the roots as well. And I have I think the first time I used it, I did tincture the whole plant, but nowadays I just don't bother. I just tincture the leaves and flowers. Mostly because I wasn't quite sure if um, I had like a super duper abundant crop this year in my new garden here out in the hill country. And I was, it's like, I don't, don't want to pull up the roots if it's actually a perennial. I, I wasn't exactly sure. I was like, is this a perennial or a biennial? What is it? Our local, one of our, our main local species, which is Onothera speciosa, which is the pink evening primrose. It actually spreads by rhizome. So I could pull some of it up and harvest the whole plant. But again, I don't need to. So I just stick with the above ground parts, the leaves and flowers. And what I found is that um, it just, it, so many different preparations um, are just lovely, lovely, lovely with this plant. So I, I, I love to dry it for tea and I got really lucky this year again. Like I said, um, I was, it just kept, it's actually growing right now. I could go do a whole new harvest of it right now in November, which is crazy. Um, it's not flowering a lot, but it's, flowering a little bit, um, but there's lots of foliage. Um, so I dry it for tea. I also tincture it straight up in, you know, 95% alcohol. I'll, um, I made a glycerite this year with it, fresh plant. And um, I like to make elixirs with the, as with a lot of plants as well. So the elixir I made with the evening primrose was a combination of evening primrose and rose in brandy with a little bit of honey. To me, I feel like evening primrose and rose go together really, really well. But I also, it's been pointed out to me that I use rose all the time. <laughs> anyway, so I think evening primrose really is, has become one of my big allies, my plant allies that it took me years to kind of fall into like, okay, what are my plant allies? And I would say evening primrose definitely has become one of them pretty quickly, so. Hmm. And why, so beyond being a plant ally, what specific reasons do you reach for plant, uh, for evening primrose for? Oh, you know, it's so relaxing. I feel like it's, it's soft. It has this softness. And um, so on some level, it's got a, it's got a sweetness, but I, I, I usually the first, whenever I was, like, I went down to the garden today to taste it again, fresh, just to kind of refresh my memory. And it just is so soft. But it also has this uh, Kiva Rose would say, she calls it like a peppery taste. Uh, it's a little bit strong, a little pungency to it. But then what I find at the end is it's got this acrid impression at the end and the acrid part, right? That's what we would define as like that little tick in the back of your throat that identifies for me, ah, this is a Nervine. And that's really where I draw. That's one of the main things that I use Evening Primrose for is as a Nervine. And um, like the tea blend that I sent you was, uh, what is this? Evening primrose, oat straw, and rose. So it's just, it's just happy, super happy Nervine tea. Um, and people need Nervines quite a bit. I feel like I combine it often with milky oat tops, fresh milky oat tops tincture with rose tincture. Um, we've got a lot of blue vervain that grows here. So yeah, I'll combine all those different things, different ways um, to use it as a Nervine. And of course, I love that it's local and I have access to it. Um, I have a couple funny stories, which one, my friend Caroline Riley at Whole Life Living, uh, Whole Life Learning Center, she also has a, um, she's a, she's an herbalist and she has it growing and there's lots of school children there. And she says when she needs them to chill out, she just has them eat the evening primrose <laughs> leaves and flowers. I she's like, go eat those pink ones. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was teaching it to my students one day at the American Botanical Council and the, the, the species they have growing there is one of the yellow ones. I think it's a Onothera biensis. 
I don't know the common name and um, but it's the big, big, big one. And I mean, some of my students were just like, just melted. It just made them melt into relaxation. So, you know, if I had to pick apart how it's a nervine, it, it seems to be um, really have an effect on the musculature, um, really just calming to the musculature, uh, easing, you know, tightness and stuff like that. Um, what do we call that? relaxing to the musculature. <laughs> yeah. Antispasmodic. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anti yeah, antispasmodic. And um I was I was uh thinking about the way Michael talks about constitutions and um how one one very common constitutional um type is what he would call crispy critter or somebody who's who just kind of runs on adrenaline and how you know, evening primrose can help with all the different aspects of our um, constitutional biology or constitutional uh, physiology that are diminished by adrenaline stress, right? So evening primrose will support the nervous system and calm the musculature. Evening primrose will support digestion, which is a huge one too. I want to talk about that in a minute. It'll support reproductive health. Um, and actually, I don't use it for lung things, but actually kind of reviewing some of the information in preparation for this podcast, I was reminded that it actually has a really healing effect on the lungs and can be really great for working with in terms of um, helping somebody with who has a history of asthma, for instance, um, which makes sense because it's so nourishing to the tissue in general with that sweetness. But so it just feels like from Michael's idea of the adrenaline stress type person that it nourishes all the areas that are kind of forgotten about as you're running from the saber toothed tiger all day long. <laughs> and this morning I had that kind of experience. There was no saber toothed tiger involved, but I was just <laughs> running from thing to thing. And like, it was just one of those days, like nothing's horrible, but you know, I just like had woke up on the wrong side of the bed and I was cranky and things weren't going the way I wanted them to go. And I was kind of mm -hmm. like, Arr! and then, it, then I remembered the uh, elixir that you sent me, which I've been taking yeah. every day uh, since I received it. And I was like, oh, now's the time for that. I've just been taking it before because it was like yummy and fun, you know, but I was like, now I need it. And I took yeah. it and it was just, I love that when you hit the right, you know, like elixir tincture in that moment that you need that like calmness and support to come in. It was just that feeling where I was like my shoulders just was like ah oh, and I just felt like I was grounded <sighs> yeah. able just to see clearly and like the world around me was not as you know as upsetting as I was trying to make it to be in my head you know so um, yeah my and the plant the flowering plant is so beautiful I mean, the yellow evening primroses are beautiful, but the pink one is just like, are you kidding me? You're like this beautiful pink flower. Are you kidding me? And around here, like it grows in mats. So a lot of the evening primroses, the yellow ones, some of them can be very, very large. But the pink evening primrose, I don't know, maybe it's usually about a foot. Well, it can be shorter, but maximum is like a foot tall. But you'll have like spread, you know, stretches of them. Um, so you might see them along the highways, for instance, um, in my garden, it's just actually literally taking over, which I'm just like, go for it. <laughs> go ahead, take over. You're fine. <laughs> take as much space as you want. But they're so beautiful. And I just feel like that's part of the when I take the medicine, I remember I think about the plant immediately. And I think about that flower. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just really, really lovely. It's very feminine. And I don't really well, you know, gender spectrum um, I try to translate that into our new understanding of the gender spectrum. So I think, although I didn't study Chinese medicine at all, I haven't studied it at all. I would say it definitely has more of a yin energy, a very much more moistening, uh, calming, relaxing, even its association with evening, which I've tried to see the pattern to see whether it really blooms just in the evening. And it doesn't around here. I mean, oh, really? I, I was going to ask. It's, it's blooming today in November outside right now. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it does its own thing. Um, but when you see it um, in the evening, it shimmers, you know. Mm -hmm. Here that they, they very much open in the evening and oh. um, it's such a beautiful thing because it's, it is such a delicate flower. And so 
to watch it yeah. and first open in the evening and it blooms all night. And then in the sun the next day, it wilts pretty quickly. So mm. past mid morning, you don't really see evening primrose flowers anymore. Um, you have yellow ones there? Is that what you have growing there is yellow ones? Uh, so I love evening primrose flowers. So I have all sorts of kinds. Like I get them at the native plant nursery and I've gotten some from mm -hmm. herbal apothecaries. And so, and I'm not, I have not been really good about keeping up with what species that I have. I just find another evening primrose and tuck it in somewhere. Yeah. Um, right. But my first interaction with evening primrose was, I, so I didn't know this plant at all. And I was at a herb conference in Oregon and somehow I found myself in the, it was at this person's place who had a large garden. And so somehow I found myself in the garden with a bunch of herbal elders and they started singing. And I like, I didn't really, you know, I was just there for the, you know, to be with the people and they started singing. And then like, as I began to become more aware of what was going on, we were encircled around this large patch of the tall mm -hmm. evening primrose, which is the yellow ones. And as they started singing the flowers, they're pretty dramatic, you know, they kind of, they're like all together and then they just like pop open. Um, wow. And so it was just this very, like, I, that was a wonderful introduction to a plant that I truly had not like ever before mm -hmm. been aware of. And then the moths, those big hummingbird moths started coming in and- Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, it was a very beautiful experience. But yeah, so up here, but you know, I'm much more north than you are. So that probably yeah. has maybe something to do with it. Maybe of just, you know, the different opening at night or evening mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even even so, I mean, obviously in other parts of the country it has that evening energy and definitely the yin, the yin, more yin energy. So if I move it out of the feminine masculine binary just move it over into you know it's definitely more yinny you know um and i think that can be called for so much with just helping people feel more at ease feel calm in their bodies and calm down and re rest and and you know in a lot of ways that's a lesson that i learned during the covid year we'll call them the covid years <laughs> right you know it's like oh well we don't have to run around in this kind of um manic capitalist um production oriented mindset um like let's take the time to rest let's take the time to do nothing <laughs> let's mm. take the time just to just to be um and i feel like evening primrose really allows that i want to circle back to your uh evening well your primrose bliss tea blend you mentioned it briefly uh -huh. But let's circle back because that really is a brilliant blend. I love the simplicity of it, but also the power behind it of um, the primrose, the rose, and the oat straw. It's so nourishing for the nervous system. Oh, it's just beautiful. I was thinking about like, how do I, what do I usually mix with the evening primrose uh, when I'm making myself a tea blend? And so I think that recipe was three parts evening primrose, two parts oat straw, and one part rose. And I know that the evening primrose can be a little difficult to find. You have to probably have to harvest it yourself to find it. So I wanted to make the two other, the other herbs in the formula, I wanted them to be easily accessible. Um, but a lot of times I'll also throw in some rose hips um, because of course, yum. Um, and it just becomes even more nourishing on a, another level, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the evening primrose and the oat straw just are so, they're actually so similar in some ways with the evening primrose just being a little bit more flowery and the oat straw being a little bit more minerally, but they say they still have the same kind of deeply nourishing calming effect on the nervous system that I like so much about them. Um, and I like that yeah. you suggest keeping it for 20, 30 minutes or even longer. Um, that's yeah. Absolutely. Nice there. Yeah. You know, when you harvest your own, tea herbs, I feel like, you know, let's get the most out of them. Um, they're so precious when I have to harvest, when I have to quote unquote harvest them myself, you know, it's just like, I try to make sure that I have enough for everybody all year. And it's, it could be a lot to try to make sure I harvest enough. So fortunately, like I said, it's growing in my garden now and I don't have to um, wait for them to be growing out in the, in the meadow. I just got them all in the garden, but so, yeah, I like to drink that tea, especially in the evening. I just find it really calming and relaxing and nourishing. But yeah, so it's not even just like so many Nervines have a bitterness to them. And that's not my favorite. That's not my favorite taste, shall we say. I like I like the sweet things. So 
that's a, probably another reason that I like the evening primrose is it doesn't, you know, you taste it and it's not, it's not offensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's very inviting. Yeah. Yes. Inviting. That's a good word. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that recipe with us. And for the listeners, if you'd like to download your free recipe handout, then you can visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. And Tatiana, our botanical illustrator, has created a beautiful illustration to go along with this recipe card. And Jenny has made it into a lovely handout for you. So lots of hands and together to make this beautiful handout for you. And uh, again, it's just a wonderful uh, brew of a tea as well. And, you know, I mean, on the card, I think it's um, the beautiful pink evening primrose that I have access to that grows here, but you can use any evening primrose for that. So any of the yellow ones should be just fine. And I will say also, botanically speaking, there's a another genus of plants called Gora, G-A-U-R-A. And that genus is also, a lot of those have been reclassified botanically as Onothera, as evening primrose Um and uh, I was tasting one of them in the garden today to see what I felt. Like the flowers are very, very, very different, but they're super beautiful. They just look very different from the evening primroses. And um, which have four pet, the, all the evening primroses have four petals. And then they have a stigma, which is the female part in the center of the flower that sticks up above. It's like sticks out above the, the petals and it's got four parts it's like a little cross so that's actually a pretty good way to identify to help you kind of recognize the evening primroses especially if they're yellow by the way because some people um, in texas i've heard that people refer to them as buttercup and i'm always like well a buttercup is actually in in the butter as a ranunculus and they're not edible they're more on the toxic end of the spectrum so I try to clarify like what well, those are buttercups and these are evening primroses, but you can always tell because it's got that female part sticking out of the top. But the Gora have a different botanical um, structure and they are also just as nourishing and relaxing and uh, really work just as well. Um, I'm sure they all have their differences, but I would use them interchangeably for sure. Oh, interesting. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, they're really, really pretty. Um, you know, one thing I, I haven't mentioned yet, which is I think is one of the places that Evening Primrose really shines because uh, there's a lot of nerve vines and we love them all. But one place that Evening Primrose really shines is in its effect on the digestive system. And um, I think I first heard about this from David Winston and I'll give a shout out to Kiva Rose who's written about Evening Primrose quite a bit. Um, but it has... Uh, an effect at kind of transforming um, depression that's associated with your digestion. So I think of it as like when I've eaten a lot of heavy foods and I tend to be, I tend, my mood does tend to be affected by what I eat um, for sure. And, uh, and so if I'm eating a lot of, uh, by heavy foods for me, that would be things like wheat and dairy and cold, 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 Ooh. sweet and, things like that. Um, uh, yeah, I can definitely slip into more of a, di uh, a depressed mood. And I've witnessed this in lots of other people as well, some of my clients or students or family members. Um, and it, and for me, the evening primrose kind of shifts that really quickly, um, just to have a little bit of tincture or tea or elixir will actually really, really help me shift out of that, that depression um, caused by the digestion. So I'm not exactly sure what it's doing in the digestive tract, but it does seem to help transform it. Mm. Makes it another reason to turn towards this tea for the evening, perhaps um, after a large meal. Or yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, and I also, I do think that, you know, in in our herbal um repertoires uh, repertoires the i it's such a great addition to add in for uh working with people with depression um you know because you can work with diet and herbs but then this one kind of brings them all together and is like um uh, kind of kind of makes that bridge between the two right there so mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just keep like feeling like I'm swooning over it because the beauty itself is somewhat, you know, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share about evening primrose, Ginger? Well, you know, I think about an, the other, um, 
I, I do teach about herbs in relation to the chakra system um, as a way of kind of uh, thinking about what uh, what organ systems plants have, but then how they are also associated. They can be associated with different chakras. And I, I think about it for the sacral chakra, for reproductive health, for um, working with menstrual cramps and things like that, for sure, but also nourishing, again, the yin of that system. Um, I think about it at the solar plexus, which of course is digestion, but then somehow it always ends up having an affinity with the heart and with the heart chakra. So it's not so much that I think it affects the cardiovascular system so much as it just like, I mean, even just the way we're talking about this plant where we're just kind of swooning and being all kind of giggly and happy about it, you know, that's such a heart opening kind of a thing. So I, maybe that has to do with the softness of it. Um, maybe some of the reason I mix it with rose so often is because it has that affinity where the rose is a little bit more astringent and the evening primrose is a little more moistening um, and they just they just pair really well together. But that's the way I think about it when I think about herbs is I think about the organ system affinities as well as the chakra system affinities. And um, so I would say heart, solar plexus and sacral chakra would be where mm -hmm. I would place this herb. You know, it just makes me think of ginger is just the difference between, um, you know, like memorizing facts about an herb and then the, di then the difference of like when a herb becomes your plant ally and you work with it for so many years, yeah. because that's what's coming through is just like you have this deep experience and relationship with evening primrose that was not built overnight, um, but comes through years of working with the plant, spending time with the plant. As you said, making all these different potions with the plant. Um, really forming that deep relationship and that's such a special thing in all of my classes we all choose plant allies for the class and I tell people this is something you keep doing for the rest of your life because then you know, like maybe evening primrose will be a plant ally for me in the future maybe it won't but the fact that you have that relationship and then you're here sharing that with us is just a beautiful thing to help really understand this plant beyond you know facts that you could read you know, in the back of a book or something. So it's a beautiful yeah. sharing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. She's a beautiful plant. Yeah. They are a beautiful plant. <laughs> well, next, Ginger, I would love to hear more about how you walk the plant path. I'd love to hear about your school. I'd love to hear about Texas medicinals and just all the ways that you are immersed in plants in your life. Well, you know, so Texas Medicinals is my medicine making company, which just grew naturally out of the fact that I was, you know, tincturing plants all the time and you have to figure out something to do with them. So next thing you know, you know, 20 years later, I'm still making plant medicines and sharing them with my greater community. And um, I have to because it's like I don't have enough clients to to share all this plant medicine with. It has to go out to to more and more people. So um, I've been doing that over 20 years. I mean, when I realized how long I've been, I've had this the Texas Medicinals part of my business. Um, mm. Sacred Journey School of Herbalism came about when my child was about 11. So they didn't need me quite as much. And I was able to dive a little bit more into teaching. And that program has grown from a 75 hour program to a 200 hour program. And that's the level one part. And then we have, a, we have level two sections and stuff. And so, um, and now I have uh, Lauren Peterson is my assistant and one of the teachers in the school. We've got apprentice teachers and all sorts of beautiful things happening with that. And um, that keeps me on my toes and keeps me pretty busy. Mm, a whole proper herbal school. <laughs> yes, totally. And what projects do you have going on right now? Well, I would really love to write a book. I've been working on it and then it falls by the wayside quite a bit. But I have the book in my head that I've been wanting to write for quite a while, which is basically like the medicinal plants of Central Texas and all the plants that I love. Um, so uh, that that's that's in the works. Very slow, slow going, but um, hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, not too many years from now, they'll you'll see a book by me about the medicinal plants of my region. So I have no doubt that's going to be an important bioregional offering. I hope so. 
So one thing I noticed, Ginger, is that you teach September through May for your programs, which is just kind of funny to me because um, I have three feet of snow on the ground right now. <laughs> so those aren't really like the, you know, northern herbalist hours, uh, but obviously where you live is a little bit different. Um, so you have your class going right now and then you tend to enroll your classes in the fall. Right. Right. So we follow the 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 regular school um, calendar, you know, that kids go to school September to May or whatever. And that's kind of what we follow. Um, September, we don't have any outdoor classes. It's too hot. And mm -hmm. we reluctantly go look at plants in October. Um, October is actually, I would say October and March, April, May are our biggest plant months really around mm -hmm. here. So October, we're just full on in with the wild, the fall wildflowers. Um, and so the program, you know, we have uh, about the, the primary program that I teach. It's a 200 hour program and it's 75 hours of online teaching of classes where we're tasting the herbs and talking about them and learning about them from, you know, the lecture that I'm providing and things like that. And then 125 hours outdoors where we're really learning the outdoor plants. Um, so, yeah, so we do structure it around the year uh, here in Texas or that school year, September to May. And I do, I stop teaching mid-May because it's too hot. Nobody wants too to hot. go. I don't want to go teach outside. <laughs> no. I mean, I'll go outside. I have, you know, that's a, it's a prime plant time also, but it's it's hard to drag you know 30 people around out in the heat um oh because it's not just the heat too it's the humidity right i used to spend my summers in texas I spent, growing up i spent all my summers in texas and i am so grateful i did because i was spending time with my family um my grandfather yeah. and, um, my sister and stuff but uh i did not love that <laughs> it was kind of intense no no yeah it's 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 a bit intense so yeah we don't i don't teach during the summer here because I don't, I have no interest in going outside and teaching. And that's primarily what I like doing is I like teaching hands-on, you know, hands-on plant medicine, hands-on um, identifying plants, learning how to identify them, learning how to harvest them, learning how to make medicine with them. Um, so that's, yeah. And really falling in love with the plants around us. So that's, that's so much what the focus of the school is, is really just falling in love with the plants. So mm -hmm. I, I love that so much. So I also teach a level two clinical program that I've been doing for a few years, and it's based on Michael Moore's constitutional physiology. Um, you know, he gave us these these ways of thinking about the human body and how to um, basically, you know, hey, if, you, if, if somebody has these kinds of symptoms and you're wanting to create a tonic formula for somebody, here's the cheat sheet. And so it's, it's like, it's a it's a very user-friendly system once you kind of learn it um, in terms of being a new herbalist and being able to figure out how to help somebody a little bit. Um, and then I've adopted different practices along the way as I've been uh, as a clinical herbalist. Um, and so I do a lot of drop dose testing with people. And it's it's just so magical when you give somebody a drop of a tincture and they're completely transformed or they have an emotional reaction to it um, and they start crying or something, you know, something something beautiful happens, something beautiful is transformed. And um, so I'm very hopeful and very excited about the clinical program. I think it's um, very empowering to to the students and I like it more and more every time I do it, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, my last question for you, Ginger, is um, a question that seems perfect for you because you're so plant-centered and this is every, the question everyone's been getting in season six, which is, that the herbs give us so much. And so how do you like to practice reciprocity with the plants? How do you like to give back to them? Uh, reciprocity, that's such a beautiful word. And of course, I remember that word from reading Braiding Sweetgrass from Robin Wall Kimmerer. She talks so much about that. So I talk about reciprocity with my students as well. And I think that, you know, part of what what I experience at the end of every school year in May when my students do their presentations um, and I see their emotional reactions to the plant journey that they've been on and that they've been, the, the world, the green world they've been exposed to and how they've fallen in love with the plants. I It, it reminds me that this is, I, every year I go, well, I guess I'm gonna keep teaching because it seems to be doing, having an impact. And so I think that my impact, the way I, I give back to the plants is by introducing people to them and helping people 
fall in love with them because it's this 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 relationship that plants can have with us that I think I think is good for everybody. Um, you know, I don't want to anthropomorphize the plants too much, but I do feel like they want us just as much as we want them. So the way that I try to give back to the plants is by teaching about them and teaching their I mean, they might have their own names, but I, I teach I teach their their common names. I teach their botanical names. I teach their 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 families and their relatives and how they fit into the ecosystem. And I teach about how they can help us as medicines. And I think mostly just helping people fall in love with them, which is pretty easy to do if you create that safety within a classroom for people to be able to go, oh, my gosh, look at that flower. It just happens naturally. So that that's probably the main way that I'm giving back to the plants. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful, Ginger. I just I love what you're doing so much. I love that focus on the plants, on the ecosystem and on the introduction of people and plants. And this world would be such a better place if we had you know, someone teaching this bioregional, heart-centered, plant-centered <laughs> way, you know, around every corner. So I'm so glad that you're there and providing this incredible opportunity for people in, in Central Texas. Thank well, thank you, you so thank you. much for being on the show, for taking time for this, and, and for sharing your love of evening primrose. Thank you, Rosalie. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Ginger's recipe for Primrose Bliss Tea Blend. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also find Ginger at gingerweb.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely swoon-worthy plant. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.